I, I think when he was talking about, you talk about Tea Party passions and energies, and we've all been here for a long time. We've all, I mean, I'd always love the quest, the famous question at the Tea Party thing, how many of you are fairly recently politically involved? And a bunch of hands go up. You've been here all the time. You've been living your lives, looking at government get bigger, taxes get higher, government reach farther into your lives. But you've just been so butt whipped by the whole thing that it almost wasn't worth getting up off the couch and say, I could vote, but <sighs> something different about now. Something different. We feel the same way. We look at government getting bigger, and doggone, it looks like we can do something about it. We look at taxes going out of control, and it looks like we might be able to actually do something about it. So as our final speaker, before we get Andrew Breitbart up here to tell us some things about what he's doing in the wonderful world of the internet, she's been invoked three or four times. Might as well get her up here. The co-founder of the Tea Party Patriots, Jenny Beth Martin. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here in Dallas. I've heard about Dallas since about June of last year. And you guys are doing incredible things here. And I really want to thank Philip and Lori and Ken and Katrina. They are setting the way here and they're setting an example that we can use around the country. And every single one of you who stood up earlier who said you're a local coordinator or rather a neighborhood coordinator, that's the example that we need to be rolling out to the country. The fact that you're doing that with Victory in a Box is excellent. And we really appreciate that at Tea Party Patriots and I know that the coordinators around the country also appreciate it, so thank you. Earlier, Mark Davis talked about how after the election in 08, a lot of us were looking around trying to figure out where to split our wrists. I, I didn't do that because about this time in 2008, I realized that we were probably not gonna have the elections go the way that I wanted them to go. And I got involved right, I was, act, I'm a geek at heart. Those of you who know me know I'm a geek at heart. I'd been using Twitter, have a blog, and I was very active online. And I was, right after the election, I got involved with a group of ladies who started a website in a social networking community called Smart Girl Politics. And that was, how many of you are a part of Smart Girl Politics in here? You're part of the beginnings of the Tea Party movement. There's also a group of people, well, a couple of people, who got active right after the election, and they started trying to figure out a way that conservatives using Twitter could communicate with one another. And they came up with a hashtag on Twitter called TCOT, Top Conservatives on Twitter. They, too, were laying the groundwork for the Tea Party movement. There's another person who, before the elections in 08, Eric Odom, started something on Twitter also called Don't Go. And it was in reference in August of 08 to Congress who was saying to Speaker Pelosi, don't go home, stay here and do something about the energy problems we're having in America. Those three groups laid the groundwork for what became the Tea Party movement. After the rant that, Ro that Mark talked about, that Rick Santelli gave, we got on a conference call, and there were 22 of us on that call. We found out about that conference call because we were tweeting using pound SGP, which is, stands for Smart Girl Politics, and pound TCOT on Twitter. That's how the, the message of the conference call got started. So every time that I talk about the beginnings of the movement, I always want to give those three organizations a shout out because they really did roll up their sleeves and get started and help this movement by not giving up after the elections in 08, but saying, what can we do to be better? So we had that conference call and there were 22 of us and really when we hung up the phone, we thought if we have five or 10 tea parties, that will be a success. And, and Mark said we wondered what is a tea party? Honestly, we were all conservative, most of us. We were wondering what is a protest? You know, <laughs> this is not in my, my DNA. 
In Atlanta, on that very first Friday when we had the tea party, there were 500 people out. It was cold and rainy. It was in the low 40s, which in Atlanta is pretty chilly, and it was pouring down rain. And we had people, businessmen in suits, holding their umbrella and holding a sign. That's how we protest. <laughs> you know, we're not, we're not like the protesters of the 60s. Yet in the 60s, when Woodstock happened, Time Magazine reported on it immediately. We had, in September of last year, about 1.5 to 1.7 million people in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Time Magazine didn't report on it at all. Not a photo, nothing. At the end of the year, I flipped through the Year in Review magazine thinking, okay, surely there'll be something about at least one protest in here. Nothing, nothing at all about it. Well, in, like Mark said, we had 1,000 groups in January. By April 15th, we were at 1,500 groups. And around April 15th, I got a call from Time Magazine saying that I, I, I was a token. I had been listed as one of the most influential people in the world. <laughs> and so Sarah Palin, Glenn Beck, Scott Brown, and I were the token conservatives. And we were there um, as people of influence with other very influential people in our society, like Lady Gaga. <laughs> Uh, um, President Clinton, um, which he is influential, I don't argue that. Um, it, 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 was, it was surreal. The thing is, it wasn't about me being listed as a time person. They just had to pick somebody in the movement, and I happen to be the person. It was about you. They were finally paying attention to us. They didn't pay attention to us in April of last year. They didn't pay attention to us in September. They didn't pay attention to us at the end of the year. But finally, they realized, hey, we better pay attention and start reporting on this. We call ourselves a news magazine. Yeah. So, so they did. And um, we've continued to grow. I got, it. I got involved in this movement. Rick Santelli, when he gave his rant, he talked about a couple of things. One, he said, let's go have a tea party. He said that our founding fathers, he was complaining about the stimulus. Now the, and by the way, the reason that Rick Santelli's rant was so important, it's not because he was saying anything so new. Because if you listen to Sean Hannity or Glenn Beck or Rush Limbaugh, you could hear the exact same thing every single day. The thing is, he said it on CNBC. We don't expect that on NBC. And that made news because it was something different. So he talked about having a tea party, our founding fathers turning over in their graves. And he talked about the stimulus bill. And he said that the stimulus bill was a problem, that we did not want to pay for our neighbors' houses who have extra bathrooms when the neighbors can no longer afford them. Now, how many of you agree with that statement? <laughs> I do too. I truly agree with that statement. In February of last year, my husband and I had just finalized our bankruptcy. He had a business that went south. He had a terrible business partner. And so we realized we were going to have to file bankruptcy to handle the debt from his business. And when the paperwork was filled out, we should have filled out something so we'd be able to keep our house. Somehow that didn't happen, so we lost our house. Well, the bank, and we've been in this house for 11 years. It was a traditional mortgage fixed rate. It was, it was our home. The bank told us, we can fix this for you. We can get you a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan. <laughs> we just filed bankruptcy. We didn't need another loan. We couldn't afford our house anymore. And now, I want to be clear. My husband did take unemployment. He took it about 18 months after he had been unemployed and he just couldn't get a job. That 
decision was one of the toughest decisions that we had to make, whether or not he should take unemployment. I, I think having a safety net, even the government having a safety net, that is okay. And it was not an easy decision for us to make. But when the bank was sitting there saying, hey, here you go, we'll get you caught up on your mortgage, and then you can just keep your house, that should have been tempting to my husband and me. It really wasn't tempting at all. We knew we couldn't afford it. We knew we were having problems, and we knew we needed to deal with the consequences and start over. And that's what we did. So we gave up our home. We, at the time, our children were five and a half years old, and in Ken were they, they were in first grade, I guess. So, um, no, they were in kindergarten at that time. So it wasn't really easy moving in the middle of the school year, making sure our children didn't get too effective affected. We did stay in our neighborhood so they could stay in the same school. That was the one condition I had. And luckily, so many other people were having trouble selling their houses that there were a lot of houses for rent. But we, we let go of our house. So in February, we had literally just moved, and we were desperate for money. We needed money so bad, we needed a way to make ends meet, and we um, were cleaning houses. That's what we were doing. We were literally cleaning our neighbor's houses. And as we were doing that, I said, you know, I, I don't enjoy this. It's really, no, I don't even like cleaning my own house. So <laughs> I, I do it, but I, it's not something I enjoy doing. So obviously cleaning someone else's house, not one of my favorite things. But I was proud of it because it was something I was doing on my own. I wasn't relying on the government. We're making the money to pay for at least the basic utilities and basic rent. And so we took pride in that. So when Rick Santelli said, we don't want to pay for our neighbors' houses and bathrooms they can no longer afford, it really, really struck a chord with me. Because that's what we felt like. So we got active, really didn't have time to quit working on cleaning houses, but I couldn't help it. I had to be out there. My husband knows me well enough to know that he couldn't stop me. So I, I, we went, we did this tea party, and we've been active in it ever since. After November, on the 9th of November 2nd, we really are gonna make a difference this year. We're already making a difference, as Mark pointed out to you. We have to hold our elected officials accountable. And we, as Americans, we're gonna have to make some tough decisions. We've been complaining about things for the past year. The government cannot continue to spend the money that it is spending. We cannot sustain it. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, it's not fun making the tough decisions. Sometimes it's not very easy, and it's very tempting to keep on spending and ignore the problems that you have. But we cannot do that, or our children and our grandchildren, they're not going to have a home. They're not going to have liberty, and they're not going to know what the Constitution means. So keep getting active, continue to be involved, get involved in the Victory in a Box program, Commit to at least an hour a day. How much is your liberty worth? How much is the liberty for your children and your grandchildren worth? Our founding fathers, they gave everything. And it's not fun to roll up your sleeves and give everything, but right now, our future generations, they're depending on us right now, today, to do that. So I'll continue to give everything that I have. I hope that you join me, and together we're gonna to stand shoulder to shoulder, we're gonna make a difference in America, and we're gonna reclaim our founding principles. Thank you so much for having me.